In an affluent area of the city, there is a luxurious house with the most attractive prostitutes in all of Germany. Despite being an expensive place, their beds are never empty. The women, mostly naked, greet men with glasses of alcohol, whispering sweet nothings in their ears. The place is enveloped in an air of sensuality, eroticism, and danger. These individuals are unaware that they are kissing Nazi spies specially trained, and that with every word they say, they could be digging their own grave. This installment of military history is not suitable for all audiences, as we are going to tell you the story of the most infamous brothel of the Third Reich, the Salon Kitty. During the most brutal period of the Nazi regime, the Third Reich established its own secret intelligence service, the RSHA, initials for Reich Main Security Office, which was founded in 1932 and the first chief was Reinhard Heydrich. Its main objective was to ensure that every suspicious individual was monitored at all times, but not only dissidents were included on the blacklist, high-ranking Germans were also susceptible to doubts and suspicions, especially those who did not demonstrate an exacerbated patriotism or a radiant enthusiasm for the growth of the empire. Among the espionage and persecution tools of the National Socialist Intelligence, perhaps the most striking of all was Salon Kitty, a luxury brothel. Among silk sheets and naked women, the aim was to gather useful information for the regime. That Temple of Lust was located at No. 11 Extrib Street, in a building with commercial premises that today houses a hearing aid store and an interior decoration store. No one could suspect that between 1939 and 1942 the most famous brothel of the Third Reich operated there, a place where the most important politicians of Germany and the rest of Europe went to satisfy their sexual appetites but also to be spied on. The establishment was named after the madam of the place, Kitty Smith, whose real name was Katerina Samet. The woman was in charge of the brothel since its creation in the early 20th century, when Berlin was one of the most liberal cities in Europe. She was the cornerstone upon which the nights of alcohol and excess that took place within those four walls were sustained. Salon Kitty was located in an affluent part of Berlin, and its clientele consisted mostly of politicians, businessmen, and high society figures, influential and powerful people who moved the city's economic strings. At the most exclusive events, you could even find ambassadors and intellectuals who succumbed to Kitty's girls' charms. Heydrich understood that it was an ideal place to monitor these individuals, corroborating their loyalties or registering their lies. He was one of the most feared officers within the structure of the Third Reich, famous for his relentless methods that earned him nicknames such as, the Blonde Beast, or, the Butcher of Prague. The incredible thing is that Kitty Smith was not very in agreement with the Nazi regime since 1933, when National Socialism officially took control of Germany, she took care to send her savings to the United Kingdom, her plan was to escape the violence that was looming. In addition, the conservative and hard-line policies proposed by the Reich did not coincide with her business line. However, over time, the National Socialist officials understood that brothels and cabarets played a fundamental role in keeping the troops calm, so they became more lenient. Kitty tried to escape German soil in 1939, but was arrested by the political police at the border with the Netherlands. She was taken to the Gestapo headquarters where she met Heydrich and his subordinate Walther Schellenberg, Brigadier General of the CCS. She agreed to collaborate, but it was not entirely clear how she would do so from her position as the owner of a nightclub. What she did not imagine was that the RSHA had already delineated plan to use the brothel as an intelligence center. Initially, the aim was to infiltrate the place with some party-affiliated prostitutes, but they soon realized that they had the power to simply take over the space and place microphones in every room. Anyone who did not agree with the new management would receive a one-way ticket to the extermination centers, by orders of Heydrich and Schellenberg. The entire basement of the place was adapted to house a complete surveillance office, with cabinets for documents, telephones, and of course, recording stations connected to dozens of microphones. Down there, five intelligence officers worked in secret, listening in real time to what was happening in the rooms of the Salon Kitty. These soldiers transcribed everything they heard, in case the information could be useful in the future. It was not only valuable to capture some kind of controversial statement or expression of dissenting opinions, but also to keep a record of the visit of important men to extort them in the future. An ambassador surrounded by naked girls and alcohol, what a shame if he does not cooperate with us. His family will find out and he will lose his job. 
This was especially useful when Germany received visits from foreign politicians. Many of them knew about Salon Kitty's reputation and wanted to come and check the rumors about the beautiful women who worked there. To attract an increasingly important clientele, Walther Schellenberg directed an ostentatious renovation of the top of the brothel. The goal was for each visitor to have an unforgettable experience and, in the process, reveal valuable information. Upon entering, the first thing clients saw was the salon's lobby, with a grand piano, crystal chandeliers, and thick carpets. The nine rooms of the center were comfortable and spacious, with a bed and furnished armchairs, ideal for hiding the SS microphones. Each bedroom had a significant supply of alcohol, which encouraged conversations and confidences that could be used by the Nazi leaders. At the same time that the entire upper part was modified, it was necessary to renew the staff of Salon Kitty. This for two main reasons, on the one hand, the plan required that the place offer the most exclusive prostitutes in all of Berlin, women for whom politicians were willing to risk being seen, on the other hand, the German intelligence service also sought prostitutes who would respond to Schellenberg and not to the owner of the establishment. For this, it was fundamental to employ new people who had no kind of respect bond for Kitty Smith. For several months in 1940, one of the main activities of the RSHA was to search for the most attractive young women in the capital city and then train them in espionage activities. They had to be beautiful, intelligent, speak multiple languages, and have a favorable opinion of Nazism. To find the right candidates, the Berlin police raided the most exclusive brothels in Berlin and took the most reputable prostitutes. Once arrested, an interview was conducted to determine if they were suitable for the job. Once accepted, the new women of Salon Kitty were trained by CCS officers and the intelligence service of the Third Reich to distinguish between the different types of military uniforms at a glance. It was necessary for the girls to be able to identify the rank of the client to assess if the interrogation process was worth it. The higher the hierarchy, the more desirable the information that man could provide. In addition, the prostitutes were given a list of items that turned a consumer into a suspect. Among these points were his nationality, the reason for his visit to the country, the amount of money he was willing to spend, and the attitude he took when Nazism was mentioned. After each encounter, the prostitutes had to deliver a report about the client. What they did not know is that there were microphones in the rooms recording absolutely everything. This was one of the many details that were not communicated to the manager of the establishment, Kitty Smith. Although she continued to be the visible face of the place for propaganda and pre-existing popularity reasons, the Nazis did not inform her about any of the methods used. Access to the basement offices was strictly prohibited and not much explanation was given regarding the 20 new prostitutes who were incorporated during Heydrich and Schellenberg's intervention. Schmidt also had no control over the clients who were attended to by these special women. Schellenberg had spread the word at cocktails frequented by diplomatic politicians and businessmen that in Salon Kitty there were new girls and that to receive VIP treatment you had to present yourself with a password, I come from Rotenburgo. If a man arrived and said those words he was sent to the new prostitutes who provided preferential service at the modest cost of being recorded by officers of the CCS and the Gestapo. The new look of Salon Kitty made the place's popularity spread throughout Germany and the neighboring countries. Among the high-ranking Nazi officers, it was one of the favorite places to spend their free time and spend the meager salary that military life offered. Heydrich and Schellenberg's plan worked immediately. In total, about 25,000 conversations were recorded and examined meticulously by the officers in the basement. They searched for keywords for information that could connect the client with some kind of insurgent or contrary to the ideals of the Third Reich politics. Among the list of visitors to Salon Kitty, several notable people of the time with succulent secrets for the curious and always friendly ears of the prostitutes were found. One of the most striking presences was Galeazzo Ciano, son-in-law of dictator Benito Mussolini. To hide his presence, the Italian used a rather striking method. He entered a cinema room near the brothel, waited for the lights to go out, and then slipped in through the back door to the brothel. After the hot encounter with one of the girls, Ciano returned to his cinema seat before the show ended. It is reasonable to assume that he preferred longer films and double features. The most incredible thing is that, according to testimonies of prostitutes, Ciano did not express any kind words about Adolf Hitler. His words were documented both by the men in the basement and by the woman who attended him. 
However, no special measures were taken with Chiano, who years later was executed for treason. We invite you to share your opinion on how this hypothetical event could have affected the outcome of the war. Leave us your comments and subscribe for more historical analyses. Thank you for following us to the end. If you are new to our channel, subscribe and follow our social networks in the description. Remember, a people who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it.